Um, this wasn't actually posed for, but I did take about eight pictures before I found a good one. If you're in a big company and you know you have this problem where um, it's a big silo, you've got to throw big chunks of documentation over from development through to operations to transition things to the live environment. This is where Agile's changing a little bit. You know, originally it was very much a, a retaliation against waterfall methods where um, someone might not release for six months or 12 months or 18 months. Now, my experience is all with websites, so it's a bit easier. You know, you have full control of the product. You can release it all the time. And we've driven down those releases shorter and shorter periods, down from months, which I think the original Scrum was around, sprint was 30 days, down to sort of two-week iterations. And now we're pushing that time down smaller and smaller, finding smaller and smaller parts of functionality that can be released. And every time one of those is complete, release it. Okay? So it's about moving towards a sort of continuous delivery pipeline. Every time you've got a smaller release, there is less risk in that release. There's less chance of something breaking, less chance of something horrible going wrong. So you're reducing the risk of every single release. You need to make it fast, though. Because if you do all of that work, and at the end, you've got this big chunk of work you've got to do, which doesn't deliver any value, but just gets you transitioned from development into the live environment. It's quite a big cost. It's a lot of effort. I don't want to have to write something, or I don't want to have to even get up at four in the morning, you know, because I need to plan that ahead. When it's complete, can't I just go and release it straight away? If I can, I cut down on all these transaction costs at the end of a project. Okay, so these are things that you can say. If you're going to try and build this in, it's big savings to a business. You have to get development and operations teams working together. You cut down all the coordination costs. I don't have to chase people for sign-off. I don't have to find out that someone's off on holiday for two weeks because no one else knows the process. I've got to wait for them to come back to sign it off. If you start to build continuous delivery in, you push a button, something goes live. This is the technical stuff. You're all developers. So how do we get to a continuous delivery situation? Um, one of the things we've done is move away from having lots of branches of code. So before when people would uh, work on different teams, working on different projects, we'd take a branch off the source code and everyone would work on that branch for that project. And at the end of that, the project is development done. But you've got to integrate it into the main line. And that's one of these transaction costs. You're not developing at that point. You're just trying to move the code into a position where you can hand it over and transition it to live. A big transaction cost, and you don't get any benefit from it, and it's painful, and it's full of sort of error-prone merging. It's quite scary. So instead, we have one line of code, and every feature gets checked in on the same line. And when it's ready for release, and it's always got to be ready for release, we can release it. I don't know how we're doing for time, but if you have any more questions on that later, you do it because it's, it's a little complicated sometimes and di difficult to get your head around, particularly if you're used to branching. 20 minutes, I'll talk slower. <laughs> I'll run out of slides. Okay, so you know, you're continuously releasing, yeah? You're in the horrible situation where after a couple of days, someone finds a bug and it's got to be fixed, and you've got other features that aren't quite complete, so. How do you do that? Yeah? Well, you can go back to where the last release was and take a branch at that point. So instead of branching for your features up front, branch for the fixes afterwards. You can still release. You can work around it. A delivery pipeline. So we have developers who work in pairs mostly, sometimes. I'm looking for some confirmation from the team sitting there. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> You make a change, you get into work, you make a change, commit that change into a version control system. We have a build server that watches every couple of minutes. It'll see, has there been a change? It will take that information out and build it. That gives us an artifact that can be tested. That artifact can be deployed onto an environment. So every change it gets deployed onto a continuous test environment and some tests run against it. And if it's good, it can, well, okay. 
I've got to push a button at this point, but it gets onto a stable test environment. There are some people in some environments where they've got um, a lot more confidence in this. And whenever anyone commits, it goes all the way through to live, providing it passes all the tests. If it's got a stable test environment, I know that if I push it to live, it's going to work. So what happens? Yeah, We've got this bit of code that people have been developing. Again, we're using test-driven development. So we have a component, gets checked out, gets built, and all the test suite gets run against it. This is a, uh, we have a service-orientated architecture. We've got small components that have nice defined responsibilities. And then on top of all of those, we've got a big website at the top. This one, fairly significant component responsible for managing most of the warehousing systems. Um, all the tests continually passing. And if they pass, that tells me that the little bits of functionality in all that code works. It doesn't tell me that that component works as a whole. So after it's deployed onto a continuous test environment, we run, you know, it's now deployed. We can test its interface. Does it interact properly with things? So we have a whole set of tests that run against that and see if it's working. Um, we use Cucumber, which is a Ruby thing, um, which means that Sam, our business analyst, project manager, can write the tests after talking to the business in an English-like language. And then we can take those and turn them into something which drives our applications. And we can see that that application works. It meets the business requirements. On the continuous test environment, we've got a lot of control. We sometimes call it unstable test because things are being deployed to it all the time. So it's not always a guarantee that if, as a human, you went along and tried to use it, it would work because things are constantly changing underneath you. The test will change the data in the database, set the test up into a state where you expect it to work, and then run the test through it. Some of these tests are marked as at live. That means they're sort of non-destructive. We can run those against a system that is deployed in a live environment and validate that it is working, at least to those specifications. We can't go in and change the data underneath the live system at random. Sometimes it fails. Um, first time I actually tried to demonstrate this once we got it in at the hut. Um, I broke the build. I thought I made a small innocuous change that I could push through to live really quickly, show, look, we can get, I can make a change. It can be in live in under five minutes. And I broke the build. And actually, that was a kind of better demonstration because I could then go on and push the button that said deploy to live. And all it does is deploy the last working good build into the live environment. I can't take something that's broken and push it down the pipeline. It won't get that far. This is really good from a, a, a service uh, operations point of view. It's a lot of safety. There are checks built in. And it's all traceable. OK, so if the build is green, it's all working. I can then, uh, we use Jenkins. It was Hudson, but someone upgraded it, and it changed its name at some point. But again. I can deploy to stable test, very easy. At that point, I can do some more testing, manual testing if I want to. Same artifact gets passed along. It's a very similar screen. I think that one probably says stable test. That one says live releases. You probably won't get them mixed up. But even if you do, you're not going to break anything. Um, deployment to live does sometimes fail. We can't take the software and deploy it to an environment as a whole because some things change. I, again, Francis talked about configuration files. Sometimes the configuration is a little different. That's why it's important we have some tests that run against the live environment. The configuration might be different. The configuration we might have got wrong at some point, or we might not have moved the configuration through to live, or there might be a switch in live which is different. So even at that point, there are tests that run against that live deployed component. Is it still working? You can't read it, and it's probably too blurred. But that one failed two months ago. It's been deployed a lot since then. Once you've got this deployment that's continuous, that's very quick, and something fails once it gets to the live environment, you kind of got two choices. 
I've, there's a few. You can run away if it's a really horrible thing and you don't want to have anything to do with it. You've been through all these checks and tests, you know, fairly sure that it's going to work. For some reason, it doesn't work. Because it's all traceable, again, it would be nice if it was the click of another button, you could roll back to the last working version. It'd take you about a couple of seconds to deploy. At the moment, I think we have to type ant deploy. So it's not, it's, not been, it's not got a web interface over the top of it. But actually, if it's a small fix, a small change, you can go in, make that change, commit it, have it built, have it deployed, have it tested. Look, it's all working. I can push it to live, and I can fix that in under five minutes. If I understand what the fix is, it's quick. So it can get to live, and it can still go wrong. So we still have some monitoring in live. Well, we've always had monitoring live. We've got a good ops team. So we know what's going on. We can see what's happening on the servers. We've got every component has a web interface. So we can easily, even if it's not doing anything webby, just processing messages or passing information around or processing data, it has a web interface that tells us about the status of that component. So we can query it. We can get Nagios talking to that component, saying, is it up, is it running? If it breaks during the night, it can ring Deepak up and tell him he needs to restart something. 